So, sorry everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. We were just having some technical difficulties with our phone, but welcome to um, our fourth Thursday's Lunch and Learn. And before we do get started, I just want to introduce myself quickly. I'm Ashley Francis, the new program coordinator for the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas. And so everyone remember to hold your questions till the end, and you can submit them by phone or by chat. And now I'd like to introduce Holly Nuravac, MD, from Baylor College of Medicine, and she will be presenting an overview of breast cancer treatment. All right, well, first of all, let me say thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm so happy to be doing this talk for the collaborative. Um, and let me also apologize for our technical delays and the difficulties that we had, but I'm glad that we're up and running. Uh, so with no further delay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my task today was to talk about the basics of breast cancer treatment. So today I'm going to begin by starting with just kind of a general overview. Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about the major modalities that we have in breast cancer therapy. So I'm going to start with surgery and then move on to chemotherapy, radiation, hormonal therapy, and then finally a few brief words on targeted therapy. So first of all, breast cancer treatment is actually um, really a huge gamut of choices. There are so many different types of breast cancer, and all of the treatment varies tremendously depending on various factors. Um, it's really like different flavors of ice cream. Um, very, very different. You can think of probably about at least 20 different subtypes of breast cancer and most of them are treated all just a little bit differently depending on the type. Um, a lot of things go into the decision of how we treat breast cancer. The biology is probably the most important thing because the biology truly determines how any breast cancer will behave. So for example, the, one of the most important determinants of how we treat cancer is based on the biomarkers. So for example, some people are estrogen receptor positive, others are um, negative for estrogen receptor, the uh, HER2 marker can be positive or negative, which very much affects um, both prognosis and treatment. Some people are triple negative, meaning that they're negative for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. And again, this affects treatment and the way that we expect the cancer to respond to therapy. Some cancers are very indolent and low grade, um, and others are very highly aggressive and very high grade. And again, all of these are approached in different methods because we know that they'll respond differently to treatment. The histology also definitely plays a role in how we treat breast cancer. The most common type of breast cancer is ductal carcinoma, which starts in the milk duct. Um, that's about 85% of breast cancer in general. Uh, lobular cancer makes up about 10% of cancer. And then the remaining uh, types of cancer, mucinous, tubular, phyllodes, and sarcoma, these are all rare cancers that we sometimes see in the breast. And they make up approximately 5% of the remaining breast cancer diagnoses. And again, each of these will behave differently and respond to different treatments based on the type of cancer that the person has. Um, the stage of breast cancer obviously also makes a difference in our treatment. Um, there can be non-invasive, meaning ductal carcinoma in situ, which is very early and should never be treated with chemotherapy. Um, in contrast, you have invasive cancer, which includes stage 1, 2, 3, or 4. Many times chemotherapy is offered for invasive cancer, but not always. Uh, tumor size plays a role, lymph node involvement, uh, sometimes skin involvement is going to make a difference, um, nipple involvement, and then also the question of whether or not there's metastatic disease will also obviously make a difference in treatment and goals of treatment. Um, in general, stage 1 through 3 are considered to be curable, and stage 4 breast cancer definitely can have long-term survival. Uh, depending on the type of cancer, um, but in general, stage four typically cannot be cured. Um, there's an 89% survival rate in general for all breast cancer diagnoses in this country. That means that for everyone who comes in with any new breast cancer diagnosis, about 89% are still alive at five years, which is truly quite remarkable. Um, there's been a lot of progress that's been made. This is actually a graph here to just kind of explain that, that um, early on in the 80s, um, breast cancer death was actually quite high, you can see here. And then we start to see this very steep decline. It's actually about, okay, it's actually about a 25% um, decrease in breast cancer death since about 1990. Um, and we see that around this time is actually when 
regular screening mammograms were introduced. Actually, the regular screening mammograms were about in the mid 80s. And so then we consequently see the decrease in um, mortality from breast cancer after that. And also around this time is when chemotherapy started to routinely be used. Prior to that, breast cancer was thought to be only a surgical problem. So with the improvements in treatments that we've had, we've actually had a really wonderful reduction in breast cancer death as well. And surgery is definitely one of those treatments that has improved greatly and is partly why we have improved survival now in breast cancer. Um, now, most women, when they are diagnosed with breast cancer, many of them are usually given the choice between mastectomy or lumpectomy. And it's a very common question that people ask about which one they should have. Um, and it's important to know that there have been multiple studies that have looked at mastectomy as compared to lumpectomy with radiation. And the two are really felt to be essentially equal. When you look very closely at the studies that have been done, um, and these were done mostly in the 80s and 90s, there is a very slightly higher local recurrence rate with lumpectomy, um, but it's very small, and it does not affect what we call overall survival. So it doesn't mean that the people that in the lumpectomy group were living for less time in the mastectomy group, even though they had local recurrence at a little bit of a higher rate, um, it was very much savable, meaning that at that point you could do a mastectomy, and it doesn't change anyone's overall outcome. So in the end, the results are the same. So for that reason, we don't really recommend one versus the other. It really is a decision, a personal decision for the person. based on a lot of different factors for them. Um, there was, however, I was going to talk about briefly, a recent study that was just published and actually made some news um, in the journal Cancer. And it actually was a study that showed maybe a possible slight benefit with lumpectomy over a mastectomy, which was quite surprising. Now, I will preface this by saying that all the previous studies that looked at mastectomy and lumpectomy were all much older studies. And so the treatments were actually different at that time. Treatments have improved. And this may be one of the reasons why this newer study is actually showing results that are a little bit different. But this study was done in California, looking at a large registry of all women that had stage 1 and 2 breast cancer. It looked at over 100,000 women. And it wasn't what we call a randomized trial, meaning we didn't start and then assign them to different groups. It just looked back at treatment that had already been done. So there could have been various reasons why certain women got mastectomy and certain women got lumpectomy. Um, and it was not a controlled study in that way. But nonetheless, by looking at this data, um, they actually found that the people that had this blue line on top stands for breast conserving surgery and radiation. So meaning this blue line on top are people that had lumpectomy, and the red line below are people who had mastectomy. And what we're looking at on this axis here is survival. So what that means is that actually the people that had lumpectomy actually did live a little bit longer and actually did do better than the people that had mastectomy. This was a very surprising study. Um, they actually looked at all the different subgroups. So for example, they looked at women who were estrogen receptor negative and positive. And they looked at women who were less than 50 years old and older than 50 years old. This particular graph happens to be for ER negative women who are less than 50. But they basically found the same thing across all subgroups and in the group as a whole. It was very surprising. And really, this was the reaction for most of the medical community. This was not an expected finding. One of the reasons this may have happened is that, again, this is not a randomized trial. Um, so we do know that the mastectomy group, the two groups were not exactly the same. The people that had mastectomies tended to have a larger average tumor size, which we would expect because Currently, in this country, since we know that there's really no true advantage to having mastectomy, as oncologists, most of us recommend breast conservation surgery. Um, so people who are having mastectomy, for the most part, for many people, probably had to have it because they had a larger tumor size and breast conservation surgery may not have been an option because the tumor was just too large to do a lumpectomy. And that could obviously affect um, how they did in terms of overall survival. Also, the people in the mastectomy group had more lymph node involvement. So again, this could be another reason. They also had a higher tumor grade. We know that all of these factors could have led to them maybe not doing quite as well as the people in the lumpectomy group. Also, interestingly, when they looked at racial and socioeconomic data, um, white women at higher socioeconomic levels were actually more likely to have had lumpectomy than mastectomy. Um, so part of the problem for that may have been that when we look at studies, we know that sometimes people who are at higher socioeconomic levels may have had better access to care, and there could be other confounding factors associated with those racial and class differences that may have done this. So again, really to summarize, just the fact that this was not a randomized trial means that we really can't take very much information out of it. 
I would say that probably the most important information that we can say right now is that at this point, we don't have any evidence to say that lumpectomy and radiation is truly better than mastectomy, but it's at least equivalent, I think is what we can safely say. So when I counsel patients, I don't counsel them that they should choose um, lumpectomy over mastectomy because of this data. I just say that at least we can say the lumpectomy is equal, if not maybe just a tad bit better than mastectomy. The things that usually people take into account when they're deciding between lumpectomy and mastectomy are, um, number one, the radiation. This is a big issue because the radiation tends to go for about seven weeks and it's Monday through Friday every day for about 15 minutes a day. For people who are working, who have other obligations, this can really be a difficult commitment to make. So some people prefer mastectomy simply for the purpose of avoiding the radiation. Um, also, after mastectomy, people who want to can have a total breast reconstruction. But that's actually a pretty significant surgery, and some people don't want to go through that, and they would rather keep their natural breast. Uh, so for that reason, some people choose lumpectomy. And with lumpectomy, as we said, the previous studies are showing a slightly higher risk of local recurrence. Um, and then mastectomy, obviously, you're getting a much more dramatic change in your body appearance and your body image. And uh, that plays a major role in why some women choose one surgery over another. Um, the studies have actually shown us that in terms of sexual functioning, mastectomy actually has worse sexual functioning um, after surgery compared to lumpectomy. And this is also true for people that have mastectomy with reconstruction. And part of the reason for that is that even those who have mastectomy with reconstruction actually have no sensation in their reconstructed breast. So typically, um, sexual function does suffer after mastectomy, which is something to take into account. Um, also, some women are concerned about the chance of positive margins. There's a higher chance after lumpectomy of having what we call positive margins, meaning that the cancer was really encroaching on the edge of the surgical specimen. This means that there could be some cancer left behind, and we usually recommend re excising those cancers. Um, and then also, one reason to perhaps choose mastectomy is that from then on, you never need a mammogram on that side. And for some women, they really like not having to worry about the anxiety of having that mammogram every year. So they prefer mastectomy for that reason. Also, I was going to talk just a little bit about the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, this has really been a, a pretty significant change that has happened recently in breast cancer treatment. Um, sentinel lymph node biopsy has been standard of care now for some time. The way that we do that is that we inject with a special radioactive or blue dye into the tumor, um, that special dye and we see the first couple of lymph nodes that take up that dye. And these one or two lymph nodes are called the sentinel lymph nodes. And now what we do in the surgery is, at time of surgery, we only remove these sentinel lymph nodes. And this is felt to be a much better marker of whether or not somebody has lymph node involvement. Um, if those are negative, the chance of having lymph nodes in the rest of the axilla is actually quite low. So typically, more lymph nodes are not removed after that. Now, the recent change that has happened is that there was a study that came out that showed that even if we have positive sentinel lymph nodes, um, you may not have to remove all the lymph nodes in the axilla, nonetheless. Um, that study showed that even in the presence of positive sentinel lymph nodes, if you're treating appropriately afterwards with radiation and potentially chemotherapy or endocrine therapy, you really are not having any advantage from surgically removing the remaining lymph nodes. Um, so many centers now, based on that study, do not do an axillary lymph node dissection, even if the sentinel nodes are positive, um, if the tumor meets these criteria, meaning the tumor was relatively small, less than five centimeters, and there was no clinically enlarged lymph nodes to begin with, um, and nothing seen on ultrasound or imaging. And if a person has not received treatment before the surgery at all, and if there are two or less positive sentinel lymph nodes. These were all the requirements for that study that proved that we don't need to do the full dissection. So if somebody fits all these requirements, um, they definitely can avoid an axillary lymph node dissection, even in the presence of positive sentinel lymph nodes. Um, the reason why we try to do less of these full dissections, meaning removing all the lymph nodes, is that there is a risk later on of lymphedema, meaning chronic swelling in that arm, pain, numbness, and limitation in arm and shoulder movement. Because as you can imagine, the more extensive surgery you have in the axillary area, the more likely you are to have many of these side effects down the road. I'm going to talk a little bit about chemotherapy now. Um, chemotherapy can uh, come either before or after the surgery. 
Um, a lot of that depends on the initial size of the tumor. Um, when it's used before surgery, chemo is typically going to be used for the purpose of converting mastectomy into lumpectomy or to um, make an unresectable tumor into a resectable tumor. So for example, if you have tumor that's involving a little bit of the, the chest wall behind, you're starting to invade into the muscle, chemotherapy can shrink that tumor so that it can then be resectable with clearly negative margins. Um, especially when we have tumors that are a little bit larger to begin with, uh, even when we do CAT scans and we don't see any metastatic disease, sometimes people have what we call micrometastatic disease that cannot be imaged or seen. And the chemotherapy could potentially kill those um, metastatic seeds, as we call them, so that they can't come back years later. And the idea is to get that systemic therapy up front for those people who are at higher risk of having micrometastatic disease, or better off trying to kill those seeds when they're still very small and able to be managed. Um, also, is the chemotherapy can kind of serve as a little bit of a test. Because if we have the tumor in and we're giving chemotherapy, then we can see definitely how the tumor is responding, making sure that it's getting smaller. If we do the surgery first and we give chemo afterwards, which is also completely acceptable, um, we are giving it blindly, meaning that we don't know that the tumor is actually responding. There's nothing left to follow. Um, and when used after surgery, chemo is again targeting any of those cancer cells which might have been left behind in the body that we're not seeing, but we know that are sometimes left behind. And this will prevent the metastatic disease later on. There are multiple different types of chemotherapy that can be used, and these are all standard of care. These have all been proven in uh, multiple trials. And there's no one regimen that's clearly superior to another. So any of these are completely fine. Chemotherapy is usually given through a port, and it can be given every three weeks or every two weeks. When it's given every two weeks, it's called dose-dense chemotherapy. Um, but you still get the same number of cycles. It's just given over a shorter period of time. This is a picture here showing what a port is. Um, a port here is this little thing labeled A, which is kind of like a little button that goes under the skin. And then you have a tube here that goes into one of the major veins. It can either go into the subclavian vein here or into the brachial vein, which is in the arm right there. And it's a much safer way to give chemotherapy. The needle is put directly into this little button, which is the port. And that way we know that chemotherapy is infusing directly into the blood system and it can't get um, extravagated out or accidentally put into the soft tissue, which is very dangerous. So some of the side effects of chemotherapy. Every regimen is a little bit different, um, but some of the more common side effects that we see with breast cancer chemotherapy are hair loss, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, mouth sores, anemia, fatigue, uh, infection from low white blood cells, bleeding from low platelets, um, nail changes, and infertility. Um, some of the more uh, pertinent side effects for individual chemotherapy, any of the anthracyclines, which includes adromycin or epirubicin, can cause leukemia about three to five years after the chemotherapy is all completed, or it can cause heart damage anywhere from a few months to up to 10 years after the chemotherapy is done. And the heart damage is more likely in people who have pre-existing heart problems like high blood pressure or cholesterol. Um, and also a little bit more likely for people who've had radiation therapy as well. Um, also, the taxanes, which are either taxol or taxotere, can cause long-term neuropathy, meaning tingling and numbness in the fingers and toes. Uh, radiation is another important part of treatment for many people. Radiation is a local treatment. It's where we give high-energy x-rays to kill the cancer cells in the chest. And as I said earlier, this is a treatment that typically occurs um, over seven weeks and it's every day, Monday through Friday, for about 15 minutes every day. It's always necessary after a lumpectomy, and you need it after a mastectomy for certain indications, for larger tumors or tumors that had more lymph node involvement, or tumors that we could not remove all of the cancer and get complete positive margin, a complete negative margin. And then also, anytime that we see inflammatory breast cancer, uh, radiation should be used in that case as well. Uh, it's typically seven weeks, and whole breast radiation is the standard of care. And there are studies being done now for what we call partial breast irradiation, which is when a tube or catheter or radioactive seeds can be surgically implanted in the breast to give radiation over a short period of time, anywhere between five and ten days. And then that device is then removed after the radiation is done. The advantages here are that you're only radiating a small area of the breast, the part that really 
probably does need the radiation the most, which is the area around the tumor bed. And you're minimizing radiation to other parts of the body. Um, typically, the lung, the esophagus, and the heart can all get small amounts of radiation, um, even using the newer radiation techniques. Um, so this typically is something that's more convenient for women and potentially less toxic. Uh, but it is being studied right now, and so we don't have enough evidence to use it routinely. Some of the long-term effects of radiation, uh, heart damage, as I mentioned earlier, uh, lung damage, uh, these are very rare now. Um, our techniques are actually much better, and very little of the heart or lung tends to be radiated with current radiation techniques. So we see these problems more with women who had radiation, perhaps back in the 1980s or 1990s. Um, also, lymphedema is an issue, potentially. And then what we call brachial plexopathy, which means that Coming into your neck and shoulder, we have a lot of nerves that control sensation and movement in your arms. Um, and radiation into the chest wall can affect those nerves. So afterwards, you can get um, difficulty with movement or difficulty with sensation sometimes if those nerves are involved in the radiation. And then very rarely, less than 1% of people can actually get a sarcoma um, in the radiated field after the radiation. Hormone therapy. Um, we obviously only give endocrine therapy to women who are positive for estrogen receptors. The tamoxifen is one of the main hormonal therapies that we use. Um, it can be used either in pre- or post-menopausal women. It can be used for either five or ten years. We have evidence to support both lengths of time. And it can also be used in sequence with an aromatase inhibitor. Um, aromatase inhibitors um, also block estrogen through a slightly different mechanism, which we'll discuss in a minute. And they can only be used in postmenopausal women. And the evidence is really to only use those either for five years or in sequence with tamoxifen. Um, and what this means is the whole switching issue is that if somebody's not tolerating one medicine very well or has some side effects related to it, they can use either tamoxifen or aromatase for two or three years. And then they can switch over to the, the other medicine for the remainder of the time to complete five years. And we know that switching over is just as effective as continuing the aromatase inhibitor for five years. So we'll often do this with patients depending on what the side effects are. Tamoxifen is an interesting medicine in that it's selectively blocking only the estrogen receptor in breast tissue. So that means that even premenopausal women who have lots of estrogen in their body can still take tamoxifen um, because it's only blocking estrogen at the breast level. So this is just a picture here to show you the estrogen receptor here. And this is where estrogen would typically bind. Whereas tamoxifen here, you can see, binds right in that same place. So it doesn't let estrogen bind there. And you can't have all the downstream effects of estrogen on the breast tissue. This is nice because it doesn't, do this, it doesn't act the same way in bone. So for women who still need that estrogen for their bone strength, um, the tamoxifen is still helping them to get the estrogen in the bones that they need. The aromatase inhibitors are a little different. This is used only in postmenopausal women who are not making any estrogen from their ovaries. So for these women, um, the adrenal gland, which sits right above the kidney, is actually turning androgens into estrogen. And the aromatase inhibitor is preventing that process. Um, this is androstenedione, dione, which is a common um, androgen that we have in our body and testosterone. And these can be converted into estrone and estradiol, or estrogen, through the use of these, this enzyme aromatase. And aromatase inhibitors are actually just stopping that enzyme. And it's a very effective way to lower estrogen in your body. Um, some of the side effects of endocrine therapy, they're a little bit different between tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. Um, when compared head to head, aromatase inhibitors are felt to be just a little bit more effective in terms of preventing the breast cancer from coming back and preventing a breast cancer on the opposite side. Uh, tamoxifen is also healthy for bones, whereas aromatase inhibitors actually cause bone loss. So we follow bone strength very closely for anyone who's on an aromatase inhibitor. Um, with tamoxifen, it's important to know that there is a very, very small increased risk of uterine cancer. There's only about a 0.4% incidence, uh, uh, incidence of uterine cancer on tamoxifen, but it's there. Um, also a very small risk for blood clots. Um, and cataracts as well. Aromatase inhibitors, um, a big problem for that for a lot of women is joint pain. At least half of women on aromatase inhibitors get joint pains, which can be a big problem. And it's actually a reason why some women stop taking the medicine altogether, because it can be quite a big issue. 
Um, both of them are weight neutral. My patients always hate to hear that. They always want to think that they're gaining weight because of the medicine. But actually, in the studies, they've all shown that both tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors don't cause weight gain. Um, there is a potential increased cardiovascular risk for aromatase inhibitors. Um, and both medicines can cause uh, vaginal dryness and hot flashes. And then tamoxifen, when used in premenopausal women, um, can be dangerous uh, if a woman becomes pregnant on tamoxifen. It can cause birth defects. Okay, and then a few words about targeted therapy. So targeted therapy means that it's not chemotherapy, meaning that it's not killing all the cells in the body that are growing and dividing, but it's actually choosing particular cells to kill. Um, this is actually one of the main reasons that breast cancer has made so many advances recently in research. We try to find the um, we try to find the drivers in each breast cancer, meaning the thing in each individual breast cancer that's actually causing it to grow and divide. We try to target that specific thing. So actually, endocrine therapy, which we already discussed, was actually probably the oldest form of targeted therapy. For some women who are estrogen receptor positive, it's really the estrogen that's feeding that tumor and helping it to grow. So blocking estrogen alone can be a very effective targeted therapy. More recently, um, HER2 was discovered. Um, and since Herceptin has come on the scene, it's really changed the entire landscape of HER2-positive disease. About 15 to 20% of women have um, a protein called HER2 in their breast cancer. That makes it a little bit more aggressive, typically. But Herceptin specifically shuts down this HER2 process. And it has increased overall survival for those women. And now we have a lot of medicines that are coming um, down the pipeline that are actually combined HER2 blockade, meaning using Herceptin, which has long been the standard of care, in combination with other, med other medicines, which even more strongly inhibit HER2. So looking at lapatinib, neratinib, hertuzumab, and TDM1. A lot of these have made quite a bit of news recently because the trials have been very successful using combined HER2 blockade. And the hope is that eventually, once we get better at all this, that one day we'll be able to look at a woman's tumor and know exactly what's driving that tumor and block only those things. Um, so hopefully one day we'll look back and think that chemotherapy was really barbaric, we really didn't need it, and we know what we're doing. We can actually target specifically these things. And we're getting closer to that, but not quite there yet. Um, so Herceptin, some of the side effects that we can see, um, it can cause an allergic reaction because it's an antibody that was made in the lab. So it's foreign to people's um, natural system. Sometimes they recognize it as a foreign body and will have an allergic reaction with the first infusion, which typically gets better with every successive infusion. There can be some reversible heart damage, which is why we check echocardiograms or ultrasounds of the heart periodically to be sure that the heart is okay. But typically when we stop the Herceptin, the heart function returns to normal. And then again, just like Tamoxifen, Herceptin is teratogenic, meaning it can cause birth defects. So anybody who's on either of those medicines, um, either Tamoxifen, Herceptin, or any of the taxanes, meaning taxotere or taxol, um, should be very careful to use protection if they can still have children. Um, and then I also put in here Avastin. Um, Avastin's gotten a lot of news recently. Um, Avastin is a particular targeted therapy that targets um, something called VEGF. VEGF is um, a protein in the body that really helps with um, making blood vessels. And the thought is that if we target this, we target VEGF, and prevent blood vessel formation, then in a way we can kill the cancer because the cancer would not get enough blood supply. And this is proven to be effective in some cancers like colon cancer. Um, but And it got accelerated approval based on some early studies for breast cancer. Um, since then, the studies that have been done have actually shown really no benefit in delaying progression in improving overall survival or even quality of life. So the FDA actually revoked its accelerated approval. A lot of women have received Avastin. Um, but now it's no longer given the standard of care. Uh, some of the side effects of Avastin is not a harmless medicine. It can cause both, both bleeding and clotting. It can cause high blood pressure, uh, protein in the urine, sometimes nosebleeds, and low blood counts. Um, so we, don't, we typically don't give it now off of trial because a lot of the trials have shown that Avastin may not be as beneficial as it was initially thought to be. Okay. And we have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any questions. Okay. Um, I guess if there are no questions then, oh, I hear somebody 
Somebody's oh, typing. They're typing. Okay. Hello? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can yes. you hear us? Yes. Okay. Do you have I, a question? I a, Sorry. I had a question about, um, I've had uh, breast cancer lobular in both breasts and at different times and went through chemotherapy, uh, mastectomy on one side and then on the other side I had radiation both times and chemotherapy after the first one. Um, a little lymph node involvement the first time, uh, microscopic and uh, axillary node dissection. I'm telling you all this stuff is kind of, but anyway, the second time, I, I, when you were listing all the things about going back in to remove lymph nodes and you said uh, about enlarged lymph nodes, what would constitute an enlarged lymph node? Okay, so what that means is that Sometimes when people have lymph node involvement from breast cancer, we can actually feel an enlarged lymph node. We can feel like a small lump in the armpit. Anytime we feel yeah. that at the time of diagnosis, we typically will take a biopsy initially to prove that it really is cancer involvement in the lymph node. In that case, if the cancer is significant enough to actually cause a lump, we don't have evidence to say that we can, in that case, not do the extra lymph node dissection. Because the study that was done where they were able to spare women the full dissection was only done in the case where you didn't have any lumps in the armpit, meaning there wasn't a large amount of cancer there. Well, in my case, they had taken out four. Mm -hmm. uh, they did this uh, sentinel node, but uh, they, wasn't, they did it just right before the surgery. It didn't like filter all the way down, maybe, but there were uh, there was just a Oh, in one of the sentinel nodes, there were evidently three sort of attached together, and then there was another one. Um, and it was in one of the sentinel nodes, and it was a macroscopic, like seven millimeters. We didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. So, um, would that have indicated, uh, would that have been reason, or is it borderline decision, or what, to go in? Since then, I've had, it's been over a year, it's been a year and a half, and I've had uh, ultrasound. I did not have the axillary node dissection. Okay, yeah, but, and, and that would be completely reasonable. So if to begin with you didn't have any enlarged lymph nodes that anybody could feel at the time, and it just turns out that in right. surgery you had some um, metastases that they found microscopically, um, in that case it's, it's very reasonable based on the data that we have now to actually not do the full lymph node dissection. And you mentioned that you had radiation on that side as well? Yes, and under the arm and everything. Yeah. Well, see, initially I, I was doing removing the breast for um, prophylactic reasons. Mm. So it was a big surprise when uh, it came back positive and it was even in one lymph node. Nobody expected that. Right, right. Okay. So then you, you've had but, cancer on but, both sides and you've had the genetic testing then in that case? I had genetic testing after that and mm. uh, it was a low oncotype score on that side. The okay. genetic cut on the other side, I had a, uh, see, the second time it was a very small tumor, or a few little tiny tumors. On the right, it was a very large tumor, and I had a higher oncotype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that's been three years ago. Okay. It was, it was lobular. Yes, yes, yes. But, so I um, don't know. You know how, I do think you compute, how do you compute your reoccurrence when it's two different cancers now, two primaries. I don't know my truly know what my reoccurrence possibility is. Do you add them together? Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, you it's know? It, yeah, it is difficult and each each cancer really has a different recurrence risk. Um, so I you're right in that either cancer can recur, but your treatment has been very appropriate. Um, and it sounds like Really, I think you've got good treatment, and your your tumors are actually relatively low risk from what you've told me. So I think that with everything that you've done, really, that's all you can do. Um, the only thing that I would add to that, though, is that since you've had cancer on both sides, if you haven't already had it done, you should get something, a genetic test, to find out whether or not you have a mutation called BRCA1 or BRCA2 that could make you more likely I have to get it. Okay, good. It's negative. Perfect. Perfect. It was negative. Then I really, I think that your treatment has been very adequate. Um, the main thing okay. that the main things that all survivors can do afterwards, then really, is just we know that exercise, regular exercise, truly reduces your risk of recurrence very significantly, and maintaining a healthy body weight is essentially important for preventing uh, breast cancer recurrence as well. Um, and then obviously just staying on your endocrine therapy.
these are all the things that you can do now to prevent it from coming back. But all your treatment has truly been flawless, and your risk of recurrence would be quite low. Okay, I, my first tumor was 10 centimeters long. It's not it's pretty bad. But, right, right. well, I'm doing, trying to do everything I can. Um, we'll keep I mean, I have a lot of questions. Somebody else is yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll take I'll take some of these questions here that people are typing in. Well, one I can answer okay, that we that we will send out the PowerPoint to everyone after it's done, and then there's one more right here. Yeah. Um, so you know, uh, so I guess somebody's asking about the extended use of Arimidex for more than five years, um, and actually there are studies going on for that right now using Arimidex for beyond five years. Until we have that data, we can't recommend it. Um, and the trials that are doing that, the national trials, have actually been close to approval. So right now, we can't recommend a remedix for more than five years. But when the data comes out, um, it very well may show that perhaps 10 years is better than five years. At this point, the only evidence we have for extended therapy is that we do know that we can give 10 years of tamoxifen safely, which is better than five years. And we also know that if someone's had five years of tamoxifen, they can very safely switch over to get five years of Primara, which is an aromatase inhibitor after that. Um, and they tend to do a little bit better than if they just stopped after the five years of tamoxifen. But we don't have evidence to extend beyond five years of aromatase inhibitor. Are there any more questions? Just one on the I'm interested in the long term. Is it fatigue after chemotherapy? Is it how long and radiation? Uh -huh. These kinds of things. Are we ever the same? Yeah. No, that's a great question. That, that's really um, a good topic for survivorship, which I'm sure is going to be probably a different webinar altogether. Um, but yeah, fat uh, chemotherapy related fatigue and cancer related fatigue are definitely problems that we see quite commonly. Um, Really, that's kind of a whole different uh, talk, truly. But over time, the studies do find that fatigue tends to get better for most women, although some women are left with persistent fatigue, particularly after the radiation. The fatigue typically gets better about two to three months after the radiation is done. Um, and that's more the, that's the general rule, although there clearly are exceptions to that. Unfortunately, we don't really have great things to do for fatigue. I guess the one thing that's truly been proven to help with fatigue is regular exercise. Exercise regularly um, has actually been proven to be superior to um, using certain medications that are sometimes used for fatigue. So I typically recommend that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no more questions, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Great, um, we would also like to thank our program committee for organizing the webinar. and. Um, our next webinar is going to be May 23rd at 12, and it's on collaborative leadership. And the speakers are Celine Meyer and Katie Butterwick of St. Luke's Episcopal Health Charities. That registration information is online um, at our website, bhctexas.org. Thank you again for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. Thank you.